Hi, I'm Brian J. Esposito, CEO and founder of Esposito Intellectual Enterprises. Over the last 20 years, I'm honored to have built a holding company that now consists of over 75 different holdings, operating over 150 joint ventures from around the world, have a presence in over 25 different industries, and also in over 25 different cities around the world. Welcome to the Inspiring Leadership Series. I'll now hand over to our host, Jonathan Bauman Perks. Well, thank you very much indeed, Brian. And it's lovely, just even on our initial conversation we've had, I found it's just full of energy. And, and you've got a great story to tell. We got to know each other through One Golden Nugget and Stephen Foster, who's such a connector of people. And, um, and also Gary Laney, as we're gonna come on to later, who, who you know, and will be and also the guest after you. So tell us a little bit more about this, this amazing holding company that you've done and, and things that, that it, it covers. And then let's go back to Brian in your, in your early years. I'd love to hear the man you are today and what shaped you. So oh, over to you, Brian. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. And thank you again for having me. It's a true pleasure and honor. So uh, this was built out of necessity. You know, I, I started in the late 90s where I built the first B2B, B2C e-commerce platform for the beauty industry. Uh, we, uh, you know, great timing, taught myself the code and, you know, we hit a home run. We became a global beauty company. And during that process, I found myself helping entities grow. I found myself helping uh, celebrities, entertainers, athletes, musicians. Uh, we, we built brands for these people. We were honored to be part of the distribution of these brands. And ultimately what kept happening time and time again was that I um, was left in, in, in the dust when they would go and that brand would excel and ultimately be sold to a L'Oreal, a Revlon, an LVMH, an Estee Lauder. Not only did I not have any equity or ownership in that brand, I also lost the distribution because they have their own distribution channels. So, you know, my mind was completely wrong for a very long time where I said, well, that's okay. I launched over 1200 beauty brands. I'll just go and get another brand. That's the whole, that's, that's the model that I thought I built. And, and, and at one point I said, this has got to stop. Uh, we, were, we saw brands that were exiting that $500 million brands, billion dollar brands, $2 billion brands. And we were their first distributor. We were their first retailer. And then they're like, you know, I like to often say, I think I coined the phrase called business amnesia. They would go, Brian, who, you know, have you, who salon professional services, who? Uh, so then I said, you know, we need to, we need to start. We talking to myself, like I have multiple personalities. We need to start. Uh, owning our own destiny, controlling our world. I can't take what I've built. And that would be my mind, my access, the way that I think, the way that I operate, my time, uh, relationships. Uh, that's all, that all has value. I, I can't let people use that and, and take advantage of that and not be part of the upside. So the only way that I could do that was, okay, well, all right, we're launching beauty brands for a band. Let's, let's build a band. So went into the music industry over 10 years ago and we built a Built an incredible band. They became a Macy's iHeart uh, top a rising star out of thousands of bands around the world. Put out an album and I got heavily involved in the music industry and, and got my ass kicked every which way you can think of. And then I said, well, there's no need for us not to, I'm not going to partner with an apparel or merchandise company. Let's launch an apparel or merchandise company. And, and the pie kept getting bigger and bigger. And mind you, this was a mess I was building. I, I just knew I could no longer be used. I knew I had to flip the script. And I said, I, I need to create value for myself and invite people into my world opposed to me being invited into other people's world. Uh, so this was roughly 15, 16, 17 years of doing this where I would build technologies, I would build IP products, solutions, and kept building all these companies. And in my mind, they, all were, they were all going to be positioned to help each other grow, share resources, share access. And, um, and it was not easy. <laughs> and we'll talk about this a little later, I'm sure. And then 2016, I got into a terrible car accident. My whole world flipped oh, upside no. down. And, um, and then I had to rebuild from, from nothing. But very grateful for the path and journey that I've been on. Now, I'm honored to, uh, you know, I, I often think about when I speak with wonderful people like you or if I'm invited into incredible rooms, I think of every decision I made throughout my life, you know, maybe post 10, 11, 12 years old, when I start to mean something and every decision, lack of decision, action, lack of action, pivot, all of those things lead, lead you to where you are right at this moment. And that's good and bad. You know, you can be in a bad moment. Uh, but if you, if you take yourself out of that situation and you often can't understand what's going on when you're in the storm, but once you get out of the storm, you start to realize everything does make sense. And I, I don't want to get religious or, um, you know, this whole thing about the universe. But 
yeah, everybody has a purpose and it depends on what journey you're on and your purpose will change. Your purpose will evolve. It'll start to become more and more clear and you'll start to really have a nice, hopefully calmness about you and understanding that you have control over your world. Uh, there are a lot of things you do not have control over. And those, those things are just noise. Those, those are things that take you off your path. And when you start to realize I do have control over my actions, I do have decision-making processes. If I do X, Y is going to happen. And once you start to really understand those maneuvering, you can do great things. You can accomplish amazing things. And that's what we're doing now. And I get, I get to work with startups, even up to Fortune 500 companies. And we just take everything that I've built and glorified matchmaking, peanut butter and jelly. What, what creates instant value? What makes things really tangible? How can we boost balance sheets? I hate unicorns. I like businesses that know how to make money. I like creating sustainable businesses that have profitable earnings and a multiplier of those earnings that the market can can understand and, and, and it's sustainable. And then you have a real business. And uh, that's, that's what I strive to do because I had to do it for myself. Uh, I got the School of Streets finance degree, <laughs> banking degree, marketing degree, everything you can think of was being thrown into the, into the wild and figuring it out. And uh, I'll take a beat because we did, we talked on a, touched on a lot of points there. But no, fascinating. But, and, and tell me the, 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 I'm really sorry to hear about the car crash in 2016. What actually happened to you? How did it damage you? Uh, well, foolishly, you know, I'm, I'm a worker. So I work seven days a week, 24 seven, always accessible. Uh, I land uh, in Nashville. I was living in Nashville at the time, Sunday morning. I get in the car and head to the office on a Sunday, the Lord's Day, shouldn't be working. <laughs> and uh, four o'clock in the afternoon, a uh, drunk driver hits me head on. She was drunk and on an on a abundance of drugs on a four lane highway. And uh, I'm grateful I get to talk about this uh, a lot because it gives people hope and it gives people understanding. Uh, so, you know, 50, 60 mile an hour highway, she, she hits me. Uh, I spin across the highway. And, uh, you know, what, what was really bizarre and, and amazing is that miles behind her, there was this incredible couple. I call them my, my angels that were blocking traffic behind her, calling 911, saying that this truck is driving uh, very radically there's something wrong uh, I, I don't know who thinks that like I've called 911 when I thought I saw a drunk driver but I wasn't blocking traffic um, because when I spun across in real situation if they weren't there I would have got clipped by another car my airbags already went off I think I wouldn't be here telling the story uh, so you know long story long is I'm grateful that that woman hit me because I'm still here she could have killed somebody she could have ruined a family she could have ruined uh, a lot a lot more than what she did and, uh, and my, my model was wrong, like I was talking about. That really put into um, force, I need to change things because I had at the time probably 30 or so holdings operating in a dozen or so different industries. And I was the glue. I was the deal maker. I was the one that had all the relationships. I was the one doing abund abundance of the, of the work that brought in the money for all of these different holdings. And then once you stripped me out, and I wasn't capable of doing my day-to-day -day operation. I couldn't even do two plus two. It would take me 30 seconds. And my mind works fast. That's just how I operate. Um, there were all these people around me. There's all these legal accounting, compliance. It was just all people with their hands in my pocket. There were certain executives that, were, that I enjoyed taking care of because that's how I'm wired. But when I needed these people, nowhere to be found. All these manufacturers that we helped launch big brands they would say things like to me like you know brian we're not a bank what do you want us to do you owe us money i'm like i i i, I look back i'm like we bought 10 million dollars from you over the last 10 years and are you kidding me you can't even no, no lifeline nothing that's so i i i was in the moment confused i was dealing with some you know obviously health issues um and not health but injury injury issues and and, and I said, okay, I need to make a decision here. Do I get mad and angry at what's happening? That doesn't, that's not going to work because I'm going to be mad and angry and have all these internal demons and, and um, anxieties and, and anger. And I got to rebuild that, 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 that's a formulation or, or a formula, a formula for just more problems and, and more chaos. And, and I can never dig myself out of that situation. Uh, so, you know, there were times where I was obviously upset but i had i said i said brian you gotta snap out of that because you gotta go and fix this you created you created something great it's destroyed rebuild it rebuild it better rebuild it smarter and uh and that's what i did and i, I made sure now that my inner circle is is 
is the cream of the crop. We have great accounting, great compliance, great legal. We even have a private security arm. And it's, it's all built to make sure that I don't put myself in harm's way anymore because I'm, I'm a people person. I like to work with people. I love to create with people. And people kind of gravitate towards me. And, and that's good because I'm open. I, I open myself into the world and that's what happens. But when you're, when, you're, when you're like that, you invite good and bad in. So you need to have processes to help you be naturally you, but also find procedures to keep out the bad. And, uh, and that's what we have, you know, and, and I'm grateful to the to, to add to that uh, when people do try to take advantage of me or, 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 or um, uh, do one over on me, because I'm like, OK, they showed me a vulnerability that I still have. I need to fix that. So I I never get mad at people anymore. I get mad at myself if if there if there even needs that to happen, because I allowed it to happen. You know, I'm not going to waste my time being mad at someone that wasn't raised in my household didn't go through my life experiences they're not going to think like i think they're not going to operate like i think it'd be foolish for me to put my mind and my brain into other people because that would drive you crazy trying to wonder why somebody did something why did they say that why did they make that move because that's who they are <laughs> the the real question people need to find a way to ask themselves is why did i invite them into my life why didn't i see these traits sooner why didn't i pick up on what this person was going to do before they did it. And that's what I love about being older now and meeting so many different people. When I meet good people that remind me of past good people, I'm like, okay, they're just like Al so-and-so, this is a good guy. Or when I meet a bad person, it's just like, I'm not going to say it in first name because someone's going to get upset, but that's just like so-and-so, I know what they're going to do. they got the same MO as this person. So I save myself some headaches. I save myself some time. And, uh, and, and I think that's a big part of, of growing and, and knowing who and who not to invite in, into your world. Yeah, uh, very profound. And in your growing up, if you were to say two or three people who've been hugely influential in shaping in the leader you are today, who, who would you call out? Uh, my grandfather, my dad's father was my best friend growing up. I lost him at eight, eight, nine years old, uh, way too soon. But you know what? He was, he was my world. You know, I'd run home from school and I want to be with him. I wouldn't want to go to the playground or hang out with kids my age. And from there on, especially after he, he passed away, I always gravitated towards older people. You know, like I'm, I'm an old soul, uh, too old for my own good. You know, I never really lived a young exciting fun life fun in my idea of fun is creating value and building companies and helping people grow that's my idea of fun but i didn't uh you know i i was just just grew up too quickly and i think he was a big piece of that because i was you know i i love learning from him i loved uh feeling his life lessons and i was a sponge when it came to him and therefore when i met older people i was like oh they're just like my grandfather so i would just continue to mm. absorb more and more knowledge uh so he's someone that uh, i think of often uh, i feel like he's on me he's with me on this journey um and uh and i want to make him proud you know mm. hopefully there's, mm. hopefully there's an afterlife and he can say hey you did good mm -hmm. uh, or he'll smack me in the face like an italian <laughs> grandfather will and say you, you messed up um so you know he he's someone very very important to me to this day even though he's no longer here and, and you know i i gravitated towards like the henry fords of the world when i would read their quotes or if i would uh, see some of what they were building uh, again i think because i feel like i'm an old soul there's there's these business traits inside of me there's these sound business principles that just i think are timeless it just makes sense to me like if you're going to go on business you got to make money. If you're going to make a product, you got to make sure you price it right where the, the market can, can absorb those prices and you have a profit in there. I don't like the uh, mechanism of fundraising traps. I don't like unicorns at all. I like companies that go into a market uh, wisely and, 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 and create a product that they can make money with or service or a piece of IP or technology. You know, seeing these companies go on these road shows where they're raising money at a market, I mean, at a valuation that they just made up, and then they're giving their cousin equity, they're giving their uncle equity, they're giving this lawyer equity, and by the time they get to their second round, even if, if they make it to that far, they're diluted out of their own company, they're now working for their investors, and, and they're completely def deflated, but that's what people are used to, and, and it drives me crazy. If you just learn how to you know, go into a market, even small, go, if you have an idea, 
test it, get into the market, see if people will buy it and build from there at a grassroots, you know, bootstrap. And those are some business practices and, and philosophies that I think should be instilled today. Um, people see a unicorn company selling for $3 billion. They never made a single profit. <laughs> then they IPO. And this is the best part. When they IPO uh, on a public exchange somewhere, the market's not stupid. Every major flying unicorn that IPO'd, all the bankers and people up to that point cashed out. And that, that price usually drops in half, sometimes down two thirds, because the market knows it's not a sustainable valuation. And you know, they, they tend to, to trail back up to break even or even even go higher. But it's many, many years later, it's sometimes five, 10 years later, you'll see a company like Facebook, I think they I put a 30, they went down to 16. Now they're flying high. But if you bought it at 30 during that IPO, you lost half of your money. Um, so again, mm. I just think I just think sound business practices and, and philosophies are so important. And, and it's and it makes it makes companies understand one golden rule. We have to find a way to make money. We want to mm. keep growing. We want to use our cash flows to grow. We want to hire people. We need to place more orders for components. Uh, the only way you can do that is if you're making money. If, if, you're, if you're trying to do that and you have to pause that because now you got to go out and raise money, then you're not focusing on your business. You're not, you, you can't do both. You can't be half pregnant. Either you're, you're running a business that can grow and you're making money or you're trying to promote a business and, and raise money. It just, it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't make sense to me. Very shrewd, very shrewd. And I, I would, I've seen that with many of the, the FinTech and the tech companies, CEOs that I work with, uh, including those who've been unicorns uh, coming <laughs> through IPOs. So I, I relate to that. Um, if we are looking back at uh, one proudest moment and what you learned from it and one darkest moment in a quick fire question, what would you choose as those two areas in your learning in both cases? Yeah, a very proud moment for me was we had a, a kid I hired in one of our warehouses a long time ago. And if you looked at his resume and his track record, you know, nobody would hire him, which is why he ended up at my, at my facility. And I just felt there was something cool about him. I just I wanted to give this kid a chance. And uh, he was phenomenal. One of the best workers I've ever had. And through the process, he, he really had nothing. Uh, when he when he first, when I first met him, um, then a year or so later, you know, he went and got his own car, got an apartment, got a girlfriend, got engaged. Um, don't know what he's doing now, but I hope he kept that trajectory. But at that moment, I was I, I felt, my God, it's it, 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 it's it is it is a who you know world, and that that drives me crazy. And it's a shame that amazing people can't get the opportunity they deserve because on paper. Or if you judge uh, like an idiot, we shouldn't judge anybody. Nobody's perfect. Uh, but if you judge in somebody, you may, you may miss out on a great opportunity and, uh, and, and you're a fool. And myself mm -hmm. included at times, you know? Uh, so that I, was, I, I was one of the first moments where I sat back and said, I don't want to take away from the kids saying that he couldn't have done that. But I do know damn well I was part of that journey. And I think I helped expedite a path that he was then mm -hmm. on. And, uh, and I felt great about that. And that carried over into the music industry and everything else that I do. Like the talent is, it's so, it's so much talent out there. It's just that people don't know how to access the opportunity. They don't know the right people. Uh, so that, you know, it breaks my heart. That's why I love, you know, there's 90 million starving art. I think there's 110 million now starving artists around the world, whether they're musicians or they're some sort of entertainer. Uh, and probably best talent in the world there's, there's people better than Bruce Springsteen out there. there's people better than Taylor Swift out there but they just don't have the resources to mm. make it happen uh so I, I'm very I get very attached to trying to help people and it was because of that moment where I saw like I you know I felt like I made a difference yeah and, and the um, dark, darkest moment darkest moment has to go back to the car accident yeah. where you know yeah. uh once once my world turned upside down and and professionally speaking i'm only talking about peers and, and colleagues and employees you know there was nobody there uh people that i supported for a very long time i couldn't get an hour from them when they when they felt that the uh the cow had no more milk they were you no know, need this cow anymore and uh and and that was a dark short-lived moment but my darkest uh, because I said, like I said before, I had to snap myself out of that. I needed to rebuild. And, and, and I'm a spiritual person. I, I feel like everything happens for a reason. That car accident, in theory, should have killed me. Uh, anybody that's been in the car accident, I'd love to ask this question to them is, I can't I remember, uh, you have, I can't remember the sound. It drives me crazy. 
had to be a massive sound, but I can't recall it. I can't mm -hmm. hear it. And I don't know if that's because certain senses kick in and you know, your adrenaline's running. Um, uh, but that, that does drive me a little bit crazy. I want to know what that sounded like. And, um, and that was, that was a very, very dark period where I didn't want to hate humankind. I didn't want to be bitter. I didn't want to be jaded, but I had to go through those five stages of grief in lightning speed. I had to just fly through it, uh, cause I had to rebuild. Um, and I had obligations I needed to make good on. Uh, I think some people would have filed for bankruptcy and started over. I, I, I don't even think I had the resources to file for bankruptcy. And that wasn't, I wasn't going to, even if I did file for bankruptcy, I'm still going to pay my bills back, but I didn't file. I just figured out how to, how to survive. And anybody listening, this is, you know, I, I, I hit a home run early. I worked my ass off with that beauty company. We were, we, were, we, we built something and made something and we, we generated a great company. Then I, then I lost everything. And I was able to be rebuild with less than nothing, nothing. And with, with, no real support around me. I had to go and, and cherry pick who are the people that I can even let know what I went through because you know not many people want to attach themselves to a sinking ship. And I may have looked like a sinking ship right there. So I had to give this persona that I'm stronger than ever, I'm smarter than ever. And uh, and I'm going to read and with this whole new idea and concept of just creating value. And, and more importantly, who do you create value for yourself? You, mm -hmm. you are, we are very valuable people and the way that you think and the way that you operate and the way that I maneuver to me, I never put a price tag on me. And that was one of my biggest mistakes. I should have, I should have always valued myself into every deal and to every opportunity. And that's what I do now. I don't, I don't do anything unless I'm properly valued. People call and email me or text me all the time. They want to know something. I'm like, well, you're going to need to value me because these other people are valuing me and I'm not going to just give away free stuff anymore. It didn't work mm. for me in the past. And, mm. and I'm, I don't have a rate card, but if you want to value me for my time, I will appreciate that. Mm -hmm. And, and, and you can have access to me. Um, mm. But other than that, it's, it's, you know, I, I, and I have to be consistent. I can't, I can't go and do things for free for X, Y, and Z because I like the person, but then I have these people over here that are compensating me or are valuing mm. me for my time. So I like the position that I'm in now. I like the world that I've built and I'm very, very selective as to who, who's going to use me, but use mm -hmm. me in a, in a positive connotation. Brilliant. Brilliant. And, and it's interesting. You talk about how profound a car accident can be and, and yours is extreme. Uh, and I really uh, feel for you in, in what you went through and particularly that what people weren't there for you when you needed them. Uh, my own car accident was n nothing in comparison, but quite profound for me in that, I was just about to go and do special, I was in the army, I was about to go and do special forces selection for the SAS. Now, I probably may never have got in, but I had got through airborne training and I'd got my parachute wings and my maroon berry from that. So I knew I could do what was required, but I was a passenger and my other buddy who was special forces was driving at speed, came over the brow of a hill and a, a, a bus pulled out it made a dash for it it wasn't going to make it and we either were going to hit the wall or we we're going to hit the bus but we hit the bus and that caused collapsed lung and and back problems and i couldn't go and do the selection never happened but actually maybe that was a good thing who knows what would have happened to me in iraq or afghanistan yeah. or something like that so that 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 didn't happen to me and i did a bit more time in the army but left the army because of my injuries right but i i think i wouldn't be here today doing this a amazing experience with you and other people had that happened to me so things do happen for a reason there is uh, a bigger plan it's just we don't often know what it is 100 percent. and thank you for your service and i love that you walked me through that because i feel like maybe you didn't think about that was a good thing no that accident. not the time no no yeah. not the time I, I just thought you know why me this is not fair yeah. all, the, all the kind of things where we we feel that sense of entitlement and poor me um the young Brian, age 16 or 18, if you went back in Back to the Future in one of those cars <laughs> and you met Brian. The, the DeLorean with Doc. The DeLorean, Brian. exactly, with Doc. And, and you said to him, hey, look, don't worry about this, but this is matters. What would you say? What, what's the bit don't worry about? And what's the bit that does matter? You may, you may hate this answer, but this is what I would tell him. Absolutely nothing. I will not shift his journey one bit because he went through hell and back and i wouldn't want to take that from him 
Uh, he's a strong little guy. He's going to do great things. He's going to fall on his face and he's going to figure it out. And I don't want to, I don't want to tell him things that he, he needs to know. And I don't want him to avoid experiences that he needs to make. Mm. Uh, but I will tell him, uh, would you say 16? So 24 years from now, you're going to go back in time. <laughs> I will tell him that he's going to go back in time, but, um, yeah, I'm not trying to chintz out on the answer, but I, 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 I wouldn't, I wouldn't steer him in any other direction than, than the one yeah. he's already on. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Thanks for that. So let's go around quick fire questions around the inspiring leadership compass. Sure. Um, you, we got. I mean, we could, we could chat for three hours. Sadly, I would love we, to. We, let's we, do we, it. Ha we haven't got that time, but we can still get a lot of value in a short space of time for those who are listening to the podcast. MQ is the first of the inspiring leadership components about what makes high performing people in the research that we've done. Moral quotient, your integrity, your values, your beliefs. What have you, from your experience, your foundational values that you still stick by? What were the top three? And uh, yeah, what are they? Yeah, well, I've, I'm consistent since that young kid we were talking about. I've always done that golden rule, do unto others as you want to be done unto yourself. And I still operate that way. I think that's, uh, I think that's the, one of the biggest foundations you need to have as a human being, unless you like to be abused and, <laughs> and that, that, uh, that quote doesn't work. Um, uh, the other thing is empathy, you know, to have empathy for people. You, you never know what anybody's going through. Uh, if anybody's giving you a hard time, they may be having the worst day of their life. You need to just say a prayer for them. Um, and, um, you know, uh, ethics. I, I've always operated in a place of ethics. It was, mm. it was one of my favorite courses in, in college, as long, along with marketing and psychology. Is, you know, the idea of ethics is it's somewhat gone. It's a little gray area now. People find a way to justify or rationale any decision. It's actually brilliant when you watch the, the person that did something wrong, black and white, but have this arsenal of support as to why they did it and all the reasonings behind it and, 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 and when, why it had to happen rather than just saying, I messed up. I'm sorry. You know, those, that's, that's very hard to get from people and, uh, and not to throw a fourth in there, but integrity is so important. You know, I, I always felt that that was really all we had in life was our integrity you know, I'd like to carry the Esposito name on strongly, again, stemming from my grandfather, who was um, very important to me. Um, so you can only really do that if you have integrity and you're going to make mistakes. Uh, something that's bizarre now for everybody is that those mistakes are recorded <laughs> and quickly distributed. You know, I, I, something that happened to us in high school is a rumor. You can't prove that. But mm -hmm. something that happens today in high school is 95 cameras on it. And, and it happened and it's factual and it's documented and it's and it lives forever. Um, those are some things that there's a, there's a nice generational gap between you know, the way that I think, too, and, and, and the older principles that I have. And, and I often feel feel bad for um, leaders that are 50, 60, 70 years old because there's that gap. They don't understand the new culture coming in. They don't understand the mindset and, uh, and, and they're blamed for it. And I don't, I don't think that's necessarily fair. There's an educational gap. There's a technology gap. Uh, and, and they're just pointed at people that grew up completely different in times where it was completely different. And they have, you know, their principles are pretty mm. much in cement. And now everything changes so rapidly over the last five, 10 years. And they're just supposed to get that and now operate in that new world or be punished or crucified. Uh, I don't think that's fair or appropriate, but I do think that they need to under, they need, they need a little more understanding, but I, I don't think people should be you know, put on the cross because they were raised completely different or went through Vietnam type wars and mm, mm. have different theories and ideas. And, 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 and um, yeah, so, you know, something that hits a nerve for me because, we all need to understand each other a little bit better. That's beautifully put. And, and you talked earlier on the second component, which is PQ, meaning and purpose quotient. Um, you, purpose was very important to you. People call that Dharma, calling, vocation, um, or, almost their intention, their life intention. Uh, why do you do what you do, Brian? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I, uh, I don't question my drive or I don't sit back and think about my instincts or my reaction to things. 
I feel very drawn to helping people and that's put me in harm's way. So I have to sometimes hit the brakes on that. Um, uh, you know, often, um, you know, often the, the bite the hand that feeds you kind of thing. I've, I've, I've learned that, um, I've learned that I'm here for a purpose and that, that accident emphasized it, but I always felt I was here to do something and it's not money oriented. Money's a byproduct of doing great work with great people. Money comes and goes. I can speak, you know, firsthand on that. <laughs> um, uh, so I'm not driven by money. I'm not driven by materialistic things, but I am driven by seeing other people benefit in a good way from the great work that we can do together. I, I do love to see people elevate and feel self-worth. It, it's great to see somebody that that was a little bit lost, especially in the startup world. Where I get I get to see this hands-on. You see a founder that has something great, and, I, and I'm drawn to not only the product and the solution that they're providing, but but them as a person. Now he or she left the corporate world that was safe, which I don't know if it's that safe anymore. They're no longer a teacher, and they've dove into this new chapter of their life. That takes a lot of courage. Uh, so when I see that, I'm, I'm, I'm addicted to that. And I want to jump in and help because I'm wired that same way. Uh, and I've been through so much. So now here, here's where it gets really interesting. And I'm probably taking your question off track is I need to let them experience things. I'm not doing them a service much like young Brian at 16. If I jump in and have them avoid a situation that I, that I know is coming, they are not going to be well prepared to be a good CEO or be a good senior management leader. They need to get their ass kicked. It's important. It's so important. So they know what to look out for and that they know they can overcome it. You know, unless it's a health issue, any, there's always a solution. There's always options, you know, but sitting in the corner and, and crying about it, adding more emotion to a situation is not going to fix anything. So, but I, I do love being there to make sure it doesn't go too far. I love being a, a good foundation for them to know that uh, I'm there. And, and I love I love when there's problems. You know, a lot of people love to come in companies that are soaring high because there's no risk and it's fun. I love to come in when nobody's looking at them because that's when you really find great opportunity and great values. And that's when you really create a bond with those investors or those stakeholders or those, uh, those founders. Good. You talked about, unless there's a health problem. Health is the next one. Uh, health quotient, uh, your mental, uh, mm -hmm. physical, uh, and your well-being. You've been through a lot, uh, through that car crash and, and the recovery from that. What's your top tip for mental health and what's your top tip for physical health that works for you? Absolutely. Um, even on the mental health, my journey's always been tough. I mean, even when, when I launched that beauty company, I was getting sued by every manufacturer you can think of because we were the first to build a new medium for distribution through online. Uh, so I was faced with problems most of my adult life where I had to figure it out. Even as a baseball player, I was faced with crazy uh, situations where the, you know, even, even if I was the best player, I wasn't being played because the coach's best friend was the kid. So I've always, always had to go through turmoil and things had to be a little bit harder for me. And, um, and if, there were times where I was very angry about it and uh, in that that kept carrying over time and time again. And I, I used to be in, in rooms where something was happening to me and I would flip a table uh, and I would, I would justify it. Like some people we were talking about before with, well, I'm being attacked. I'm Italian. I'm emotional. I look back on that and, and I don't want to leave that kind of mark on this world. I want to, I want to be, uh, I, I don't want to be known as the guy that flipped tables. I want to be known as the, the guy that sat there and strategized and worked with everybody in that room to find a solution. What, what, what's going to be a positive outcome for everybody? If there's two people here, then both people have to leave with some positive outcome. If there's a hundred people here, let's figure it out. Let's sit in this room until we figure it out. And uh, so operating from calmness, it's hard. It's not easy. I, I can't, I can't preach that enough. You gotta, you gotta come into a situation any decision you make, any decision you make, it needs to be made from, from a place where you're calm, you're at ease, and you're at peace. Um, because any other decision you make that's irrational or coming from emotion, it may not be the best reaction. It may not be the best course you should be on. And I think the only way you can accomplish that is if you have uh, some sort of well-balanced mental health and, uh, and well-being. 
Uh, and, and everybody's living in fear now. The entire world is living in fear, whether it's a pandemic, whether it's political unrest, it's economic uncertainties, it's your family and your household. And should we go to the food store? Should we have food delivered? Like it's just, and you turn on the news and it's just doom and gloom. So that life, bef life before that was not easy and stressful. Now you add this entire uh, world that we live in that's connected 24 seven. It's, it's, it's not healthy to be watching the news or reading the news 24 seven. You can't function as a human being. It's, it's, you're just going to, you're just not going to leave your house. You're going to become a hermit. You're going to become isolated. You're not going to like people anymore. And once you start hitting those dominoes and that's, that's the path you're on. Um, I don't think it's a good outcome. I really don't as a society. You're exactly right. And I make a particular point of, I don't listen to the news uh, on TV at all, uh, rarely on the radio. And um, I might look for a short period at the BBC news app, maybe once a day. Or, and I get a magazine called The Week, which gives a resume of the week of what's gone on around the world yeah. and different things from property to comedy to uh, big events. And the first thing I listen to is The Daily Stoic by Ryan Holiday, a very good American writer who pulls together all the stoic thought. So the first thing I'm filling my mind with, with good thoughts and thoughts about coping with tough, resilient, difficult situations and that the world isn't fair and what I can control is my own thoughts, my own actions. And I find that really helps my mental health. And what do you do about physical health? What, what, what do you do to uh, keep yourself physically fit and able to cope with what life throws at you. Yeah, I'm not not the advocate for that, <laughs> but I'm working on that. You know, there is a what, what's, my, the, what, what's the one thing you do now? Now I've been now I've been swimming a lot. First okay. time in my life, I've been swimming a lot, and I find that to be, uh, you know, what's great about it. Uh, unless you know, some people will probably go swimming with, with a waterproof phone and check their messages while they're swimming, but it it forces you to detox it forces you to stay in that moment which is so good for your brain not to be thinking about anything else and i love when i see these people go into the woods and hike or camp for six seven days i think i read it takes seven days with no electronics to fully get that detox out of your brain and out of your system i don't quote me on that i think i think i read something along those lines and that's a, that's a long amount of time and we're connected to these devices 24 7 and it's just just constant information. And, and that's a lot to process while you're still trying to get through your regular day. Uh, so mm -hmm. a lot of people ask me, um, because I don't, I don't really, I mean, I know what's going on in the world from my, my magnifying glass and people ask me like, well, don't you want to know what's going on? I'm like, yes, but I don't know if that information is a hundred percent truthfully telling me what's going on. Oh, we're not even going to blame that. I'm not going to say fake news. I don't know if I'm 100% reading it correctly. Let's let's blame me. If I don't want if I'm not understanding it 100% correctly, I don't want it to affect my life. And then I don't want to play telephone game and tell somebody else my version of what I just saw. And that's just not it's not real. It's not tangible. I know I can wake up in the morning. I know I can get X, Y, and Z done at work. Um, and now, like we're talking about physical side, if I can make some balance with what I can control, what is under my my management as far as our companies, um, my mental health and wellness. Of, I've been doing this Wim Hof breathing. Oh, yes. Yeah. Amazing. I mean, yeah. you know, it's amazing for me. It's 11 minutes. It's 11 minute YouTube video. You just sit there and breathe. Brilliant. That's perfect for a guy like me. And, and it works, you know, and, and if it's a placebo effect, I'll take it because it, it works. It helps me stay in a, in a calmer state than, than my DNA wants to be. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, hopefully I can keep up with this swimming. It's definitely a great way for me to isolate myself from, from the norm which yeah. is healthy well done well done um and so from health and wim hof and swimming to eq emotional and social intelligence what what's a tip that you've learned recently that really helps you in the way you link and relate to people because you connect to people really well i found from personal experience thank you so, so what would be your tip that works for you i i you got to read the room you have to read the room, including yourself in that moment, what's, what's going on. Uh, again, everybody's going through their own hell right now. Um, so I need to always be in a place of calmness. 
And if you want to talk about like a, a deal making situation or, or, you know, what is that um, EQ in that situation look like? If the goal is to get something accomplished, if I'm leading that situation or if I'm co-leading that situation with a counterparty or, or some other business owner that we want to come together on terms, I need to bite my tongue. Don't say certain things because the goal is to get to the finish line. The goal is not for me to like the sound of my voice and just keep saying things because I want to say them. You need to let the other person do that. If they're not emotionally evolved enough to understand, we just have to get to the goal. You know, a lot of times, especially people that hopefully are listening, have been in rooms where there's just somebody that loves the sound of their voice. Um, and if you were putting a quarter in every time, you would be spending a lot of money. You, I'd love to attach money to people like that because people then just get up and leave. They wouldn't sit there if they had to pay to hear somebody's sound of the voice. They're not typically saying anything of any substance, um, and they just want to. They just want an audience. So if you if you need to get a deal done because it involves employees, it involves growth, it involves investors, you do not want to. Um, you don't want to be emotional. You don't want to react. You don't want to, you don't want to kill the deal. So someone in that room has to be emotionally mature enough to just sit there and let it play out and get to the finish line. If it takes an hour, if it takes 10 hours, the goal is to get that done. And that's, that's what, that's what the, the more emotionally mature person in that room yeah. needs to accomplish. Good, good. And, and really from emotional intelligence onto what I call CQ collective cultural intelligence, which is where diversity, equality, and inclusion is so important. You know, you're in the land, um, uh, the land of the immigrants and people who've come from a whole diversity of places. You talk about your pride in your Italian heritage. I'm a mix of Scott and Yorkshire. I mean, complete, complete nuts and probably something <laughs> from New Zealand. But um, Kiwi, well, I didn't see that. Yeah, Kiwi, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> my, 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 my father and mother were um, my father and his twin. Who's, she's 90 now, my father's been dead, uh, was killed many years ago, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, they, they grew up in New Zealand. It's quite a special, special time. Um, what would you say would be a top tip for you about people understanding people and having greater diversity, equality and inclusion in the work they do? Yeah, my journey is probably not the norm. I've, I've traveled the world working with people of all different cultures and backgrounds and nationalities. Uh, and someone with my level to connect, as you experienced and you mentioned, was, was good. Uh, I'm, I'm there to learn about what their culture needs and how they operate. I'm not there to preach my way or the American way. Um, uh, Americans tend to want to come in and do things their way. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, I, I, you, you can't, it's not easy. You're, you're combining two different worlds, especially if it's a, if it's two companies with the bulk of employees, but if it just say it's two different people, uh, you both have to understand what motivates them, you know, what, what drives them. Um, and, uh, and then how do you, how do you merge these two where it's not conflict? Uh, because conflict doesn't make any sense to me. I don't need to get into a situation that's going to be a conflict. I don't need to prove that this outcome will work 50 years from now. I don't have the, the leisure of that time. And it may be because I was youngest of four and I, I was surrounded by a lot of death growing up and I lost people at an early age, I just got accustomed that life is short and time is precious. And then that accident, again, emphasized and enhanced that. So I don't need to be in a situation with somebody if it's going to be, um, I'm not saying it has to be puppy dogs and ice cream all the time, but if you can tell that it's going to be a problem, then go find another situation. There's no need to try to convince each other otherwise that's doesn't, it's not going to, it's not sustainable. And, you know, yeah. At some point you're going to butt heads again and you're going to butt heads again. And what are you trying to prove? Are you trying to prove you made the right decision? How about you prove to yourself you made the wrong decision and you're not going to spend any more time in that moment. Or hopefully if it's two people with great family value, I mean, I mean, let me back up and summarize a little bit easier. When you have different cultures, much like my mindset with basic business practices and old school philosophies, 
two people with good family values, ethics and morals can do anything together. It's when you start to introduce things like ego, greed, and materials. Mm -hmm. That I think is a consistent that I've seen in the cultures and, and, and countries that I've worked with. Anybody that wants things uh, will do anything to get things. And that means go outside the area of the law, mm -hmm. uh, maybe do some accounting uh, shenanigans, or steal from you because they want things and they want more things and they want to put them on their Instagram and the pictures of their nice car and a nice watch and their, and a nice vacation that I avoid like the plague because that doesn't mesh with me. And I'm not judging that. I'm not um, putting it down to each their own, but I know what I can deal with. I can't deal with people that want things because they're going to then try to motivate me to want more things, which means I need to make more money so they can get more things. That's, to me, that, that's a snowball to a very bad situation. So to answer your question, again, very longly, if you look at people coming together with very similar ideologies and theories and concepts on life and, and, uh, and beliefs, I think you can do anything. But when you start adding these, these other seven yeah. deadly sins to the equation, I think you're always going to fall into a problem. Yeah, yeah. Well, very well put. And that takes us on nicely to the next one, which is the resilience of bouncing back from adversity when you've come across these um, toxic individuals with ego and greed and materialism where they're just out to make what they can from you. Uh, so Brian, what would be your top tip? I mean, you've been through a lot of situations which you needed great resilience. What would be your top tip of um, coping with adversity and resilience in a nutshell? Well, firstly, meet as many people as you can. Uh, and meet as many bad people as you can as quickly as possible, because as you get older, you'll learn to spot these people and you'll have uh, a good filter in, in inviting toxic people into your life. Uh, but you have to thank them. Everybody comes into your life for a purpose. Uh, and oddly enough, everybody that's done me wrong, and there's quite a list, there's quite a list. I have met amazing lifelong dear friends and, uh, and colleagues because they also did that person wrong. So you all, you, you immediately have that trauma bond, right? With someone. And there's re, there's a couple of reasons for it. A, maybe the point of that toxic person was for me to meet this other person. And that's how you justify and rationalize it. And the, and the caveat to that is that bond is formed because you both got screwed. You, know, you both can say to yourself and laugh, Hey, that, that person took us for a ride and you, and you, and you share a drink over it. So if you look at people should think about this it, you shouldn't waste any time uh upset about someone that did you wrong and there's a there's a great quote i wish it was mine or i'll, I'll even throw it out to you this way if you had eighty six thousand four hundred dollars in the bank and somebody stole ten dollars from you would you spend the eighty six thousand three hundred ninety dollars to get it back that's really good i love that yep. one and 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 um it, well, carry, it, it carries over into time which yeah, they probably yeah. got. So you have 86,400 seconds in a day. If someone steals 10 seconds from you, are you going to burn the other 86,390 seconds to get that 10 seconds back? Wow. Yeah, that's a good one. I like that. That's a yeah. really great one. I like advice. it too, because it, it, again, so money- So 86,400? 86,400 seconds in a day. And you start, you start to, you walk people into it and you ask them if, at $86,400 in the bank because that's tangible, right? People understand money. Unfortunately, people understand money more than time, which needs to change. <clears throat> and then you say, if someone were to steal $10 out of that bank account, would you spend the $86,390 to get that $10 back? And some people, if you associate the time, would. So that's how you have to, you have, people have to always evolve and, and self-correct comparing it to other things you, you, you can't just think about the uh, moment you so have good. To, so you good have... and particularly with your experience of the loss that you had financial you can you can make money when you've lost money you yes. can't make time no it is running out on you and and you don't know how much longer your your number was almost up my father was you talked about death that happened to you growing up with four children you know my father was killed at 33. My uncle was killed flying, fast jet pilot. My uncle was killed as a helicopter pilot, age 29. 
Um, my grandfather was killed aged 50 in, a, in an aircraft. I think flying is not a good thing for my family. Um, I should, should learn something. And now my brother just died the other day, age 63. Oh. Now, they didn't see that coming. They didn't plan, oh, I'm going to wake up today and I think I'm going to die today. Mm, sounds like a good idea. I think I'm going to have a crash or I'm going to be given an aircraft that's faulty and the, the, uh, the blade on the turbine is going to break off mid-flight, goes straight through the side of the fuselage, side of fire, and we're going to die. I didn't see that coming. And, and, and I think you just have to make the most of the time that you have and therefore it is very precious. You cannot get time back. No. Uh, and that's very profound, Brian. Let's go on to brand. How do you, you know, have you had a coach yourself and have they gathered 360 feedback on you? And what was one thing you learned from that? So tell me, you know. Ne never had a coach. No, I was, I was the, I went to the school of life in the streets, you know, I, that's just how I learned. And, uh, and I don't, I don't know. Again, I, I, I wouldn't have it any other way. I, I love the experiences that I've been through. I, I love the mishaps, mistakes, uh, wrong decisions, getting my ass kicked and coming back. And, and I'm happy with the man that I'm becoming. And I, and I have a long way to, long way to go. You know, I, if I'm not evolving as a person, so I, in a way, I'm my own self-coach because mm -hmm. uh, I have accountability uh, in my actions. I'm, I'm, you know, some people need somebody there whether they just need a, uh, someone to talk to or vent to, or they need someone there to guide them. And that's great. I love, I'm happy that people have that access, uh, especially with uh, platforms like LinkedIn. It's easy to maybe find somebody that can help you evolve and grow personally and professionally. But as of right now, I'm, I'm, I self-check constantly. I, I'm, I, I, I'm there to be on myself if I think I made the wrong move or I, I didn't operate in that situation correctly. And then I got to do better. Uh, I don't really pat myself on the back. Um, maybe I need someone to do that for me, but uh, I, I'm aware. I'm aware of my actions and, uh, and I don't pacify anything. And, yeah. uh, and I think, you know, it might sound obnoxious to somebody listening, but that's where I'm at right now. Mm -hmm. you know, to, tomorrow, tomorrow I may be somebody different that, need, that needs that support system. But you know, right now I'm, I'm aware. Good, good. And legacy, the last one of the eight components. What, what would you like your legacy to be when you die? Yeah, I would, I would love to have gone through this life where I, I at least helped one person. I think if we all did that, we'd all be helping each other, right? It'd be pretty simple. Uh, I, I don't expect that to last forever. That'd be foolish for me to think that 100 years from now, people are still saying my name. Uh, but hopefully they'll listen to this great show with you, Jonathan, <laughs> and, and they may think about me. Uh, but if I could have gone through life, I, I look at the word success as going through life, not hurting anybody. Uh, and I look at the term success again, uh, if you did hurt somebody intentionally or unintentionally, did you do anything to make it right? Um, that to me is a success, not how much money you have in the bank or not how many Rolexes you have in your closet. It's, it's going through life, treating each other as equals and, and being there to help somebody because, you know, maybe I can say this comfortably because there was a time when I needed somebody and nope. <laughs> goose egg you know there, there was a time where i needed help and i'm grateful that i didn't get it because i found out the strengths that i had that i didn't know that i had i found out how to be more authoritative in certain situations and rooms to get what i should be getting uh, and if someone was there to help me and you know kind of take away how hard that was or minimize it i don't think i'd be as equipped as i am today because uh, when 2020 happened, uh, I don't, again, I don't want to sound obnoxious. I didn't miss a beat because I already went through hell. You know, I did, to me, this was another problem. And, and if you don't think there's not going to be more problems, then you're, you're not ready for life. There's always going to be a problem. And that's when you find out how strong you are. That's when you find out the resilience that you have. And that's when you, you should be looking for opportunities um, because they're out there. The bigger the problem, the bigger the opportunities. You just got to be very careful which ones you get involved in. You know, don't get in industries or situations where you don't have any experience in because that's when you start to you know, go down a, a path where you're probably going to be in trouble. Mm -hmm. um, but 
I'm sorry, listeners, there's going to be another problem. You know, this is the world that we live in. And if you haven't figured that out by now, um, you know, then ignorance is bliss to, to an extent, but you still need to find a way to survive. You need to find a way to make money. You got to pay your bills, you need shelter, you need food, you need clothes. And, uh, and that means you have to be smart and you have to find a way to earn and, and value yourself. Yeah. And, and in your um, holding company and all the different businesses you work with, you've you've met and been part of and set up many teams what's your top tip we're in the last few minutes now but what's your top tip about taking a toxic team and making it high performing if you were to give one bit of advice i i think a, a toxic environment depending on the resources that are behind and every situation is different and i need to know if they're in, if they're shareholders if they're investors or you know where they lie in this toxic team um but there's obviously problems in history there. And um, you, you, you may be inviting future problems with that same team. If you think these people are great, um, then they need, to be, they need to be repositioned inside the company or help them find another job somewhere else. Uh, I'm not a fan of fixing toxicity. I'm a fan of cutting it out like a cancer and, and, and having good positivity around a situation, a company, myself included. I don't, I, I don't have time or the luxury of time to go in and nurture this team back to uh, a healthy um, work environment because if they're not there to understand the job has to get done and, they have, and there's investors or there's employees or there's you know, other obligations that this company needs to meet and their personal issues are interfering with the company's necessities, uh, then, then it might sound cold, but that the, the, the company isn't there to, to reprogram people to be psychologically equipped to work with one another. If it's toxic, it's, it's not good. I think the word toxic is, is self-explanatory, um, but I don't think people should be hurt. I don't say you just go in and fire people. You, you help them, help them maybe another division of the company where they're not working with that same team or help them get a job somewhere, but you need, you need to keep the company as a priority in the investors and stakeholders and also the pool of employees. And what is the best use of time and resources for the whole? And that would mean getting people to, to work well together uh, and being productive. And, uh, and they all have to have self-worth. I mean, people need to feel good about what they're doing. Uh, and you know, I'm, I'm, answering this from the top down but the real answer to your question jonathan is that that person that's in that toxic workplace they need to be smart enough and strong enough to get themselves out of it they're 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 not living they're going to work every day into a toxic environment and they need to start working on where do they want to spend their time where do they want to utilize their skill sets what type of company or environment do they want to work in that that's where I think the, mm. the evolution of the answer to your question really lies is what the person that's in that toxic team needs to take themselves out of it, not be forced out of it. Yeah, that's great. Last two questions um, with exec teams, and then we'll give you your top tip, your two minute top tip. Um, favorite book on leadership and uh, who the author is and why you chose the book. Yeah, I think he knows it's coming. I got it right here. Gary Laney, my man. I've known Gary for over 20 years, The Power of Strategic Influence. I'm a little biased with this situation because I'm honored to be amongst 11 other entrepreneurs that have uh, participated in this book. I think he's done one hell of a job. Uh, became an Amazon top seller. He's just working his butt off to make this thing into the desks and uh, bedrooms of people all over the world. Uh, it's, it's, it's just phenomenal. It, it's always great to hear firsthand experiences from people that were on their entrepreneur journey, whether what industry they're in. And there's, there's 12 of us in there, and including Gary's overview of, of why he did this. Uh, and their stories and the path that they're on and, and, and how important people, I mean, there's people on there that I'm, I don't even know if I should be in this book, but the, the, what they've created and their reach and their influence is phenomenal. And when you understand that you have people in your world that are um, connected to your decisions, it's something very concerning that leaders need to understand that every decision you make, it's not just for you and your, maybe your family or your bank account. There's so many different people that it affects and are you making the right decisions for 
or for the whole. And, uh, and it's great to see uh, what, you know, people, for people to understand that how important that strategic influence is and, and the power that's behind it. Brilliant. So uh, now for the two minute top tip, Brian, if you'd be good enough to introduce yourself, uh, what you do, and then give them the two minute top tip, your favorite yeah. on leadership. Absolutely, sir. So Brian J. Esposito, CEO and founder of Esposito Intellectual Enterprises. Uh, a top tip is you need to go through every day and to the best of your abilities, love and cherish every moment of that day. You're going to have you're going to have times when you feel a little upset, you're a little angry. Somebody's done you wrong. Uh, you need to thank everybody that crosses your path, good and bad. And when someone maybe throws a little stress at you or anxiety towards you, you need to say a prayer for them and hopefully that they have a better day tomorrow. You cannot let that affect you. You have a lot of important work to do. I have a lot of important decisions to make and you can't let anybody force you to be put into a path where you make the wrong decision or an emotional decision or a reactionary decision. So always try to operate from a place of, place of calmness, from a place of cool, calm and collective. And, uh, and if you need a minute, you know, take yourself out of the equation, do a little Wim Hof, take 11 minutes and reset, readdress what just happened. And I bet you won't even think it's worth any more of your time. So I appreciate everybody listening. And hopefully that was a good tip for y'all. Thank you very much indeed, Brian. It certainly was. And it was a real honor to have you on the series and uh, to, to share your wisdom experience. And I'm looking forward to reading Gary's book and having him on next week. So thank you very much, Brian. Thank you, sir. Have a great day.